All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through. And as soon as we have confirmation on the audiovisual front, we'll get the session started. All right, it looks like we've got a very slight delay here, a little bit of a lag, but shouldn't be anything uh, too troubling. Excellent. Good to see so many familiar faces in the room. Fantastic. All right, so we have a lot to talk about today, as usual. Um, we had some interesting fireworks over about the last hour or so. We're going to look at that. But the bigger item is what's on the calendar for tomorrow. This is the start of uh, Fed Chair Janet Yellen's two-day testimony in front of Congress. Tomorrow she speaks in front of the House. Thursday she speaks in front of the Senate. Now in the past, as in if we go back a couple of years, markets may have had a tendency to look at this as a very perfunctory type of thing where the Fed was basically just updating Congress on what was going on. Over the past couple of years, though, as the Fed has embarked on this normalization kick, um, there have, of course, been some very large questions that Congress has had for Cherry Ellen, and we saw probably one of the most intense reversals over the past couple of years at Humphrey Hawkins in February of last year, which I'll certainly draw back for some examples uh, here throughout today's session. But uh, let's get right into the webinar. I see... Okay, I got one person saying they can't see. Is this a widespread issue? because I see only one person saying they can't see. Let's go ahead and go through the risk disclaimers and we'll see if we can get this fixed up in the meantime for everybody else. All right, yeah, Brian says he sees fine. All right, so we're gonna look at risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. If you're not familiar with this, please do take a minute to familiarize yourself with it. We're gonna move on in just about 10 seconds. Okay, perfect. Excellent, looks like everybody can see perfectly. It looks like the gentleman that was having an issue uh, is now able to see perfectly fine. Fantastic. All right, so that's risk disclaimer part one. Risk disclaimer part two is right here, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're gonna look at some past trades. We have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. I'm gonna give this another 10 seconds and then we shall move on. All right, let's rock and roll. All right, so uh, getting started off right here, right in the middle of the, the belly of the beast, uh, the U.S. dollar. Now, when I wrote market talk earlier this morning, it looked like this thing wanted to put in some bullish tendencies, and so we're going to have to go back a few hours here. There we go. And you can see right in here, that was NFP right at 8 o'clock Friday morning. Real wild wick, right, but we saw up pretty interesting buyer response then we saw these lows hold right here right around the 50 fib of this most recent bullish move and the dollar had crawled up to well above the 38.2 and then eventually found some support and it looked like the dollar was going to try to strengthen up going into Yellen's testimony starting tomorrow it made logical sense but earlier this morning we had that uh, well it was a tweet from Donald Trump Jr. Um, and I'm sure you've probably already seen this in the news, but it created a little bit of dollar weakness. The dollar spilled, and we went right back down to that real big support at 95.86. Now, this is a huge level on the dollar. This is the 50 fib of the 16-year move, taking the top all the way back here in 2001, drawing that down to the bottom in 08, right smack in the middle of that move at 95.86. We have this fib level that's been active on the dollar ever since we first interacted with it again in March of 2015. Okay, now if we go down on the daily chart, we can see where this 9586 levels played out quite a bit. That was the presidential election, quick spike down, support came in just above that, prices ran higher. Go back a little bit later, you see where we had some resistance, a little bit of support. So this is a big, big level here on DXY, beautiful case of resistance right in there. And again, this, this, this kind of works all the way back to March of 2015 where we see quite a few intraday tops or bottoms, little support iterations, quick little resistance check, resistance, we break above, a little bit of support before it falls back below. So this is a big, big level here on DXY. Um, now, is it a big enough level to substantiate a reversal? I don't think so. At least I'm not going to take a direct fade off of this level or off of this move in anticipation of this level holding. Okay, but it is something that I want to use in my analysis when I extrapolate this into other other pairs. Um, speaking of which, let's just get right into the one that everybody's probably wondering about right here in the euro. So uh, right now, I just have my first target hit on that last analyst pick, 1440. 
Give me one second, I'll get that for you. So this is going to allow me to adjust my stock stop up to break even. To basically go into Yellen's testimony tomorrow with uh, with stops adjusted at my initial entry price. So the setup that I'm referring to is this one, is the analyst pick issued last week. I'm going to put that in the chat box for anybody so interested. And I love the bullish structure here. Um, my next target after 1440 is 1480. That's what, I, that's what I have in my first profit target. I'm taking 1480 off of a couple of different things. We had a couple of swings that came very close up here, but I also didn't want to be so greedy as to put it right on the cycle level of 115, just in case sellers got a little bit itchy as we neared up towards that big psychological level. So 1480 is the next point. And then up here we have another interesting level at 1615. That's my next target. And given the scope of euro dollar price action over the last couple of years, I'm going to have to dig a little bit deeper to find these next top side targets. Okay, so that's the 2017 bullish channel. You can see where we have, you know, somewhat of a, we could call it a game changing type of move going on here in the euro. But if I want to get any relevant resistance swings, I have to go all the way back here to May of 2016. That's where that 116.15 level comes from. And then a little bit deeper, we have a spike high here on China's Black Monday. About 100 pips above that, 117.14. That's the next logical area to look for resistance here on a euro dollar break higher as we go into tomorrow. Now, the ideal scenario for me here is for Yellen to be able to elicit some dollar strength tomorrow. Now, how that might happen, I don't know. My initial inkling is that the dollar is so incredibly weak right now that we have some short sentiment that's been continuing to build and continuing to build and continuing to build that even just the flicker of additional hawkishness from Chair Yellen could elicit a bit of a squeeze here. Because notice where this move in DXY has retraced the entirety of what we had after the, the presidential election. And we're setting back down towards September of 2016 levels. Okay, so a huge run in a really short period of time. Just a slight hint of a more hawkish yelling or more hawkish Fed could create a little bit of strength in this thing. It could help to tip this a bit lower so that I could get an inside price action entry. Inside price action means I want to see price come in and test some of these prior support levels. Like, uh, here we go on a four hour chart. Let's see what I'm talking about, like 1380, right? And this is a good indication of a bullish market. I have a, uh, an example that isn't so attractive to show you here in a second. But this is an example of a good bullish market. We had that top side move, the trend resumption move. Okay, so here's the move, the bullish move, the retracement of that move, which I believe came in as a clean 38.2. Beautiful when it works that cleanly. See, so I'm basically just taking this low up to that high. The 38.2 is right in here. I believe we even talked about this last Thursday. But price came down, gave a beautiful 38.2 check. And then after prices burst higher, moving back in the trend side direction, and sellers came back, right? Just imagine, you know, how, how you're thinking right now with prices, right? Euro's breaking up to new highs. Do you want to chase this thing? Probably not. As we make those new highs, buyer anticipation wanes, seller motivation increases, and then you also have those buyers that were in at a lower price that want to start taking profits, which is why we see that cyclical nature of markets. But as that retracement was coming in, look at where these buyers step back in at 1380, well above the 23.6 Fib level. We've got a couple of different examples here off of this four hour chart and it hung out there for a little while, even over the weekend, right? Until eventually that dollar weakness could come through. I mean, I don't know that anybody would have been able to predict that it was gonna come off of a Donald Trump Jr. tweet, but nonetheless, the trend is the trend. And now the Euro's popping up to new 14 month highs. So I still love the setup. I don't want to chase it from here, especially when we're so close to a cycle level, especially when we're close to a really big driver. The one area where I'm interested in taking an additional risk in Euro is if we do get a pullback of some degree. Now, I got to do a little bit of projection from here because frankly, I don't know how deep this, this breakout may run. If this breakout does run all the way up to 15, that cycle level, where I think some additional resistance could come into play, at that point, I want to look for support to build in here at 14.45. If I do get that indication of higher low support, very similar to what we had here, higher low support of 1380, then I want to look at take on, taking on some additional bullish risk. Now, if we don't get all the way up to 115, if this thing fans out 5, 10 pips from here, 
then I could still incorporate some of these prior levels like 1380. If I want to get really aggressive with it, I could go even tighter. I could even look at maybe taking entries off about 14 to 1408. Because notice there's a lot of price action going on in here. Let's go down to the hourly chart. All right, you see that's right at 14. Look at the way the sellers had responded to 14 flat multiple times before buyers were eventually able to push this thing higher. And again, it, it seems like it's this, this uh, Don Jr. tweet from earlier today that's driving this thing. So 14 helps establish an area, and then a little bit higher, around 14.08, right off of that swing, which syncs up pretty well with some of these prior price action swings. It's giving me a little 8-pip zone to look for support to build uh, in a continuation approach, or I could cast it a little bit deeper, 13.80. Now, if we break below that 13.80, if we get below 13.65, at that point, I have a worry about timing the resumption uh, or bullish resumption in the setup. So if we do break below 1365, 1350, I want to let it clear and see if it comes down to 1316 or 1276. Now, if it breaks through 1276 with bearish price action, that's when I'm going to start looking at obviating the bullish stance because it appears as though something is shifting there. Uh, from the sector that we're speaking now, that shift, I would expect to be Fed related. As in, if Yellen comes out and just absolutely slams this thing and says, we're going to normalize the balance sheet, we're going to hike rates another four times going out to the end of next year, maybe even five, because we need to normalize policy because there's some very big worries for rates staying low for too long. Now, this was actually something that was in the most recent Fed minutes from that June meeting. The Fed actually had said that, that they were worried about loose monetary policy creating more financial risks. That's kind of a hot button issue there. So if Chair Yellen does say that she thinks that rate hikes will actually make for a safer economy, then that's something that could elicit some significant dollar strength, and that could break us back down this 1280 level. And if that's the case, then I don't want to be long euro any longer. So that's the first setup I wanted to look at for today. This what has been a beautiful uptrend in the euro dollar as markets are apparently trying to get in front of a European QE stimulus exit. So we have a similar type of story going on in the UK. This one, not as friendly of a story, at least not for now. I ate a stop on this one a little earlier today. Give me a quick second, I'll show you that setup. The thing is, with uh, when you take a stop in a relatively quick fashion, it's where you want to learn from it. As in, did you do anything wrong? If you didn't do anything wrong, there's nothing to feel bad about. Uh, but this was the setup that I was looking at. It was essentially trying to get bullish resumption off of this you know, what I thought was a beautiful bull flag setup. I'm going to put that in the chat box. There we go. Now, the zone of support that we were looking at in cable ran from, and this was from last Thursday, ran from 1208 up to 1261. Now, yesterday saw price action come down and rest off this 1261 level, uh, excuse me, 2861 level. And what got me on the long side of this is that price action had broken back up to the upper half of this bull flag or this, this downward sloping channel that makes up the bull flag. We caught a little bit of short-term resistance off this 23.6 fib. And I was under the presumption we had a higher low to work with. Now, what ended up happening is Ben Broadband had some commentary that was pretty dovish for the UK. He tried to avoid monetary policy, but it elicited some selling and it went right down, triggered right through my stop. Now, does that mean that I'm going to completely flip my stance here on sterling and now I have to get short? No. It's a trade, not the trend. I got stopped out of one trade. That doesn't mean that I can't try to hit the long position again if it does establish some support a little bit deeper. So until 2809 is taken out, and probably even until 2756 is taken out, I'm going to continue to look at a bullish stance here in cable. Might just have to do it at a lower price, or I might even have to do it at a higher price if this thing establishes support and then breaks higher from here. But I need some more information to fill in before I'm going to be able to time this thing because it looks like this retracement might have some, uh, some additional time to run before the bullish move is ready to continue. So I still like the move. Got cut on a stop. Move on reassess and see if I can get the set to fill in a little bit later, later on in the week, maybe even next week, but staying on the radar for now. So another one that we looked at last week in the Kiwi, this one has put in a beautiful reaction off of that resistance zone that we were looking at. So we were looking at the symmetrical wedge last Thursday, and then we were looking at the confluence of that symmetrical wedge with this fib level, which is quite simply just the 38.2 of, I believe it's the four year move. Yeah, taking the financial collapse low here in 2009, 
up to that double top at 88.43. 38 two of that move comes in right here at 73 and a third. More importantly than that, look at how this level that worked as resistance right back here in February. Beautiful job of setting resistance there. So now it looks like this one has to fill on the short side of the setup. Okay. Now, again, we want to be careful trying to prognosticate, you know, two months off of two days, right? But what we can do is we can go down a little bit tighter, like a four-hour chart. There we go. And we can see what looks to be the initial stages of breakdown. And then I could try to use price action to time that so that I could still look to play that short side set of the symmetrical wedge off the daily in a more risk efficient, a bit of a tighter fashion. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to find some areas where resistance may show, and if resistance does show, then that's where I could look to, to peg in the short with the stop just above those highs. Uh, P says, uh, cash car, due to hit the wires in four minutes. I don't think there's any chance that's dollar positive. He's been uh, a pretty big dove. He's been one of the big dissenters of lately. He's, uh, I think he even like wrote a letter to explain why he dissented at that last rate hike, a la Kristen Forbes. All right, so this isn't a great zone, but 72.50 seems to be close enough for government work. All right up there, so I'm just taking about a 10 pip zone here. You know, nothing, nothing earth shattering. And then there's something going on in here. It's Chop City. But this can be helpful, specifically for stop placement, in the event that I do get my resistance check, right? So we can see after that precipitous decline here in the Kiwi, we've seen some buyers come back in. Now this thing's wiggling higher. If we get back into this zone between 72.40, 72.50, and if I do see some resistance show, then I can look at taking a short side set so that I can get a stop above this prior swing high. Okay, so that way if the move does continue, if it does continue breaking down and if this daily is going to show me a fill on the symmetrical wedge, fantastic. But if it doesn't and if this ends up just being a quick retracement in what was an extremely bullish trend, then at the very least I don't get caught on that, right? You see the difference between cable, which I did eat a stop on this morning, and kiwi? Right, at that point, the trade had relatively confirmed that the trend side direction could be on its way back. Right? I'd seen price crawl into the upper side of this bull flag, and again, if I had this set up 10 times, I'm going to take a 10. Sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it's not. The price action is never going to tell the future. It's only going to help me see the probabilities. The probabilities here was that I could have had trend side re resumption with a relatively tight stop so that I could clear off a 1-2 even if we just got back to prior resistance. Here on Kiwi, this thing's a little bit different. Because all that we have at this point is an impulsive move that's begun to pull back. I don't have any information, any evidence that sellers are going to um, uh, re-peg in here. If I see some element of resistance showing at that 10 pip zone, then I might have that case, right? If that setup fills at that point, then I could look for trend resumption. But if it doesn't, if price just shoots right past it, it would be the same as if, if Sterling was not setting a support when I lined it up this morning. Again, I think on these, these examples of failure, that's the best area to learn. Right? It's hard to learn from wins. It's easy to learn from losses because you knew, know that you did something wrong. You know that you had something that didn't work right. And you know you have something you can optimize, something to work with. On wins, you don't want to monkey with those too much. You just want to kind of go with the flow and take what you can get. But when you do get those scenarios that don't work out in the way that you want, draw back. And see if you would have done anything different. And if you wouldn't have, that's a trade that you probably want to take anyways. It just didn't work out. All right, let's go over to another pair out of Oceana, the Aussie. Okay, so this one's pretty cool because we've been following this for a few months. This has another one of these longer term setups that appears to be uh, beginning to fill in. Let's set this one up properly. There we go. Okay, so I'm on a weekly chart now. And for all intents and purposes, Aussie has been pretty range bound for well over a year now. Now, it hasn't been a horizontal range. Notice how we've had this descending area of resistance. This trend line that's now had four. Uh, five tests off this weekly chart. Supports a little more horizontal, or at least longer term supports a little more horizontal, right, right here around 72. And we looked at this last week when we had this resistance inflection. 
And look at the way this resistance deflection just at the end of Q2 came in. It's beautiful, beautiful setup. Okay, so two really bullish days continued into a third. Prices ran right into that trend line, and then we dojied up. Okay, that doji highlights indecision. Indecision after a really big move leads into the fade. So prices come down. Sellers try to use this point to add some more short exposure. So far, it hasn't worked. We got that quick uh, quick bust of uh, USD weakness today, and it sends this right back up. But you can see right in here, here I'll just show you with horizontal rays. We can lock those to the highs. You see right in here, we have this little batch. And I could watch for resistance. And the effort of plant short side continuation. Now, if prices break back above this batch, above these swing eyes, then the idea of that breakdown is not going to look nearly as attractive. But if prices do respect that resistance, as we have over these past few hourly bars, then I could look at a short side set with a stop above that zone, or if I'm comfortable or okay with taking on the risk or trying to look at a longer term setup, basically trying to get this thing to fill in off the daily or the weekly, I might even be able to look at a stop above those highs. And if I'm trying to clear this thing down to a big figure like, say, a 75 or 74.50 or even that 72, now I could even factor that off of that point of resistance right in there after we've had this break higher over the past couple of days. Pete says four hour looks like a head and shoulder. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could see it in there. You got your head, you got your shoulders, you got your neckline. The thing that I don't like about head and shoulders, they're often like with these uneven ones, right? You know, because to me, it, each of these individual moves or, or waves or phases of the H&S, it, it says something. And, you know, the fact that, that this neckline didn't come down to test that prior neckline, you know, that to me is a very bullish thing. I wouldn't want to sign it the same quality as a straight up horizontal head and shoulders. So that's just another reason that I'll often eschew those H&S patterns. I don't know a lot of folks that have made a lot of money with H&S in their careers, just my personal experiences. But I think this zone of resistance could be pretty attractive, especially if it holds from where we're at right now. Uh, it's only got about 13 pips of run. If it breaks above, the setup's no low contender. Um, but if this resistance does hold, then it could be an interesting short side move. Beats bullish for Aussie. It's awesome, man. We can, you know, and, and this goes for anybody else in the room. I mean, Pete's a well-honed professional. He's been doing this a while, and he knows what he's doing. But we don't have to agree. That's the beautiful part about markets and trading. Uh, trader success is going to be over usually hundreds, thousands of trades in a year. And, you know, we're not going to agree on everything, you know. Sometimes I'll be wrong. Sometimes I'll be right. Sometimes you'll be wrong. Sometimes you'll be right. And the point is that you're confident enough in your setup and your strategy to be able to continue to do it consistently, even when you eat stops or even when you're not winning or even when you're in one of those drawdown phases. All right, let's move over to a pair that's a little bit more exciting. Dollar yen. So I have a saying, and that saying is when it's time for trend resumption, very few want to join the party. And what I mean by that is when you look at a move like we've had in dollar yen up until recently, when this thing's bursting higher, everybody wants to be long. But when it's pulling back, folks don't want to be long any anymore, right? I mean, that's the veracity of a trend. If we do see new buyers come in to support those higher lows, then that's what leads to a continuation move, right? But there's always that balance. Well, right now we have this trend in dollar yen pulling back pretty aggressively. If we look at this off the daily, this is going to look straight gnarly. I say straight and gnarly because we had a quick breakout to test this Fibonacci level at 114 and a half. Quick breakout to a new two month high. Actually, it's a four month high at this point. And then that tweet came out and then we've had dollar weakness reign supreme. Go down a little bit tighter for our chart. There you go. You can see that big uh-oh bar right in there. Now, the reason this is a bit more exciting for me is because now I could get back in the driver's seat looking to take on some log exposure. This is a pair where I'd be a little bit more open or a little bit more flexible with messy techs. The reason is because there has been such a strong and profound fundamental drive here. And that fundamental drive has basically been 
the BOJ is probably going to be one of the loosest central banks in the land. And this has been prevalent everywhere against the euro, against sterling, but specifically here against dollar yen when this trend has gotten really very clean, really very smooth since about mid-June. We bottomed out around 108. Now, the problem with those moves is they have a tendency to get overbought. Like if we look at this thing off of RSI, see how that RSI divergence began to show up? We had a higher high or a higher high on RSI right here, higher high on price. But then we get that higher high on price when prices are just grinding, a lower high here on RSI, and now this thing's turning, right? So I would still think that this is a bit overbought, and I still think it could have some room to run a little bit lower. But what I can do is I could use that recent gyration to try to find some additional levels in the effort of looking at a continuation approach. Okay, so right in here, you see how we have this swing high that cuts through and it catches these two candlestick bodies, actually a third candlestick body like right in there. So that's 13 and a third. I'm going to look at that. That's going to become my S1 level. Now a little bit deeper, notice how we have all of these, look at all these wicks. Right? I mean, again, just picture yourself being in between the spread here. Right? Prices come down and they wiggle back up. Come down and they wiggle back up. Down and they wiggle back up. You know, eventually, if you're in between the spread, you're going to notice the buyers keep responding to these lower prices to push price action back up. Eventually, one of these sides is going to give way. If I got a bet on the side to give way, I'm going to bet on the side that's counter trend to give way for the trend side to eventually take take over. Now again, that's not always going to happen. Sometimes we'll get reversals, sometimes um, uh, sometimes we'll get Donald Jr. tweets out of the middle of nowhere. That type of stuff can't be predicted. But what we can do is in the effort of that trend following approach, we could look at relatively tight stops so that if we do get disarray, we can mitigate that damage. There's another couple levels in here that could become usable though. Now this, I'm going to call this more of a zone, right? Because those candlesticks go from about 1308 to about 1285. Chris with a good question here, with price action, less means more when it comes to indicators, et cetera. Yeah, so a real important point of emphasis there with that RSI thing. Um, I'll use RSI for divergence just to try to gauge how overbought or oversold something might be. I mean, I guess that's what RSI is often used for, but I'm not using it to trigger into any trades. I'm using it merely as a, just like an additional tool on the side. You know how you have a, uh, you know, you have a fuel gauge on your car? It's kind of like my fuel gauge for price action. So this is my second zone right in here, uh, just about 20 pips wide, from about 1285 up to about 1308. A little bit deeper, I'd be willing to accept something in between 1196 and 1240. I know this is a really wide zone, but if we do break back below the swing, which is just very near that 1161 Fibonacci level we've been following, then that's where I want to nix the bullish approach here on dollar yen for now. But a couple of very acceptable support entries that I'd be open to, uh, very close here to near-term price action. <laughs> P says, if dollar is weak, then yen is sickly. <laughs> you know, I think that, and I think that a lot of folks are still kind of missing this, but I think if we look at gold, I think this kind of tells us what we need to know, where this is basically the central bank removing the punch bowl trade, more or less, right? Because, you know, if we look at the dollar, sure, the dollar has been really weak, but gold has been really weak, too. You know, if you look at gold priced in euros, it's going to, it just looks nasty. And it's largely because we've seen that reflation trade price back in. Meanwhile, gold priced in yen, not as ugly. But gold is inevitably priced in dollars, and that move has been pretty pronounced. And it really kicked off around June 8th, right, over, right around that James Comey testimony. and since then, there, I mean, there has been much stoppage to this bearish move. All right, let's go over to a couple more of these yen pairs to try to avoid some of the dollar mayhem over the next couple of days. So this has been one of my favorite setups for the past couple of months, Euro yen. And uh, we were talking about this for a while, largely on the basis of fundamental divergence between these two parent economies. As the early portion of the year saw more and more 
uh, increasing bets behind long euro in anticipation of uh, uh, the ECB moving away from stimulus. And then more recently, we started to see that yen weakness come back. You can see where this move has gotten pretty much parabolic. We ran right over the 130 psychological level, a little bit of a slowdown, but it didn't really resist. It didn't stop. It didn't pull back. You know, when I see these types of things, it just gets me a little bit more cautious about chasing, uh, especially when we're setting above a new big level. There you go. So, like I said, a minimum of drama, right? It's a big psych level. It cleared it pretty quickly. You even got some support down here. But don't want to chase it. I'm not even willing to take a, a 130 retest. If I'm going to look to get long in here, I want this to come back down to 29.47. It's a big level that didn't offer much for resistance, much for support. Prices just shot right through it. I fully expect the price is going to revisit back at some point in some fashion, and that's when I want to start looking at the long stance. You know, kind of like we looked at RSI a little bit earlier. Um, this is one of those trends that's gotten massively overbought, and it could continue to get more and more overbought, but the deeper it goes into overbought status, the higher the risk that one little flare-up in the news front or in the fundamental front causes a prolonged pullback that either A stops me out or B puts me in an upside-down position, neither of which I want. So even though the trend has been really strong here, I still want to be picky as far as that next topside entry. 29.50, 29.45, that could be a very interesting area. It's hard for me to prognosticate how we could get a deeper cut into this prior batch without this change in the fundamental picture or the backdrop behind Euro Yen. But, you know, some of these swings here are like 29 flat, 28.95. I would even be open to looking at that as prior resistance going in as new support, just given the veracity of that prior trend. This thing's extremely bullish in one direction, and I would like to get a, an additional piece if I could. But, uh, you know, again, I don't want to chase anything that's not set up near support so that I could look to to really tighten that risk. Okay, this one I'm a little bit closer, I believe, to taking some entry. And I say that because what I was looking at in Euro Yen is already happening in Pound Yen, but I'm getting to that stage where maybe it happened a little bit too much, right? So Pound Yen burst up to another new high earlier this morning, about 0500. Then those broadband comments came out, and we've seen some selling come in. And that selling has continued, 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 and now we're approaching this prior batch of support right down here. You can see it at 146, and I even have... Another level here. Yeah, I may have removed that fib. I have another level at 145.96, which I believe uh, is a fib from a longer-term study. And that level helped to base the support. But you can see how much tumult has been in this move lower. So this hasn't been, you know, a gyration. This hasn't been something consistent. This has just been a dead drop. Right. Well, I don't want to catch javelins, even if that javelin runs into my support. So if it's a hard-running move that comes down to this batch between 145.96 and 146 and change, I'm going to mandate that support has to show itself before I'm going to look to take long exposure. Okay. The key is I want support or I want buyers to come back in ahead of this prior swing low right there. Okay. Now, if it is... Then I could look at getting a stop in there, sub 145, which gets me below this prior batch of swings here. Okay, then I could look for the bullish reversal or the bullish setup. And if I could factor that with a smaller stop, then I don't need to go all the way back up to these prior highs to clear off my risk. I could look a little bit tighter as we test into some of these prior points of support, about 146 and three quarters or thereabouts. So this is one where, you know, very much like what we were saying a little bit earlier when it's time to start looking at trend resumption. It's the time when the fewest people often want to do it. And it's because this pullback is happening in a rather aggressive fashion. But the price action formation here, it still exists. Higher highs and higher lows, we just ran up to a level of resistance. I need to make sure that that support clears before I'm going to look to take on any long risk. But this was an aggressive topside trend, and I don't want to expect for that thing to flip over or reverse until I have some evidence that it will. Now, the way that I could play a bearish strategy here, 
on Poundian is I would need it to break through that batch of support that I'm following right now, and I'd want it to break through this swing right here. Now, just below that, we have 145. So the picture-perfect scenario would be prices breaking through that support, finding some support around 145, wiggling back so that I could then use this zone as resistance, and then look at downside short continuation setups. Again, all in the effort so that I could manage my risk by tightening that stop so that if I am wrong, the damage is mitigated. But if I'm right, I could sit there and I could peel off the position as it moves deeper and deeper and deeper in the money. Okay, so we touched on gold a little bit earlier as mainly just a compass point. But wanted to look at this from a setup uh, perspective here. And I wrote about this yesterday. Uh, gold prices broke down to another new low. Uh, we broke below that May low that had come in right here, about 1219 to 1215. Um, but I've essentially just re-signed, reassigned this level as R1 resistance. Now you can see where prices are tiptoeing up towards there right now. If that doesn't hold a little bit deeper, 1228, I think we have another interesting area of resistance. Now, if we break all the way up to 1241, I'm still open to short side approaches, all in the effort of getting my stop above this level. That's the 50% fib of the most recent major move uh, for which I am qualifying last July's high down to the last December's low. 50 fib of that move comes in right here, 1248.98. If I could get a resistance at 1241 so that I could get a stop above 1248.98, I'm open to taking on that short exposure and looking for continuation of the move lower. Here in gold, DB says euro taken off. Beautiful. All right, fantastic. Nine pips away from my next target. Love it. All right, give me one second. I'm going to go on the phone real fast. Going to tighten up a little risk. All right, let's start getting some questions. Uh, from Chris H., and I'm not taking these in a chronological fashion, just uh, picking on as uh, as they come in. Uh, are you a big proponent when it comes to support and resistance? Absolutely. I think that's the – I think that's the uh, – probably the, the sunniest spot of technical analysis is in the fact that it can be a uh, risk management tool. I think a lot of folks don't really give it credit for that. A lot of folks think the technical analysis is supposed to show you what's going to happen or, you know, get you 100% winning ratios, and that's just, that's just not possible. Um, but I think the biggest bright spot of techs is that it can show me risk-efficient ways to uh, plan scenarios, right? And, you know, for that risk management, you know, right there at the forefront, support and resistance. That's that's the you know the very core of it, in my opinion. Uh, can you cover the S and P? Yeah, absolutely. Would be happy to. Um, so this thing put in another dip this morning, and you can see again this dip was, was promptly bought. Let's go out a little bit longer. I have a trend channel in here. Just to try to get the gist of, of price action in the spoos since the presidential election. You know, of course, we've had that rip roar and run. But more recently, and I think this is what's given a lot of folks some indigestion, is the fact that we have not been able to cauterize further gains since like early June, right? We popped back above 24 right here on like May 25th. And since then, we've had a couple of tests of support. But there hasn't been that, 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 that flare away run like we've had of recent where – Well, here, I mean, we're we put in like a near parabolic type of move, right? Um, and so I think that's what's given a lot of folks indigestion here. But, you know, in my book, S&P, it's still in that buy the dip mantra until it isn't, at which point I think we'll all have a pretty good idea of when that's going to be. And we're, what I'm looking for for that is a break of 24. If it breaks the 24, no more dip buying for me, at least in the interim. Got another potential support debt level down here between 2347, 2321. I could look for some secondary support to develop there. If that doesn't develop, then that's where I might be getting a little bit more open to a short side set on, on spoos. But for most intensive purposes, if I'm going to do anything short equities, I probably want to do it here in the NASDAQ. Um, you know, go right for the tip of the spear, go for tech stocks with high beta. If we are going to see a spill, if we are going to see a turn, I think it's going to show up here first. 
and and this is putting in somewhat of a bearish formation. Uh, this looking at the Nasdaq 100, uh, very recent new low prices picked up after you know about a week, but we got a doji here today after a two-day sequence of strength. So you know, we could be looking at a lower high. Uh, Chris H, can you recommend more information on price action? Well, there's a couple different ways of going about it. Um, if you're looking for more of like a, an educational track, I have a uh, something here that could help. So I'd authored this back in like 2012. And I called it the Forex Trader's Guide to Price Action, where I go through a lot of the very basic uh, types of things. From there, I would suggest trigger time. I think that back testing on charts, testing on charts, I think that's by far the best way to get more familiar with, with price action. So, I mean, I'll even still do this today. I'll go back in time, go back in time, go back in time. And then I can simulate an hour's worth of price action by pressing the forward arrow on my keyboard one single time. One single time, one single time, one single time. And then I can make price action decisions off of that. Like, okay, well, we just had a spike low down to test prior point of support. What would I do here? Okay, we've got a long setup now. Or now we got a, well, another long setup. Take it off support, close it off resistance. Another long setup, close it off. All right, and I can basically just simulate this one key press at a time. And it's a way of essentially trying to cram a lot of experience in a really short period of time by simulating price action with uh, with a chart. I think that's the best way of going about it. Now, of course, if you look on the internet, there's going to be a lot of different products for sale and books and whatnot. Um, I've never used any of those. Uh, never really been interested in them. I've always been much more of a DIYer that wanted to kind of figure it out on my own. So that's that's kind of my, my uh, source of background. Uh, from Augusto, hi James, hope you're well sir, LDHF, views please on dollar index, gold, oil, spoos, please. Uh, certainly dollar index, I mean, it's hard not to be bearish right now. Um, I think we even got another spill here as Kashkari was speaking. Yep, sure enough, we're up below 95.86, <laughs> right down to the 7.64. Um, so I think this is probably a pretty good time to plug our forecasts. <laughs> um, I did the Q3 technical forecast here on the US dollar, and uh, this is what I was looking for, further losses. Uh, the 95.86 level specifically was where I was watching for a downside break, uh, just so happened before the end of the quarter. But I uh, just put that link in the chat box for anybody so interested. Uh, for Pete, uh, USD moves interest and open for ideas, really focus on near-term setups because I don't think any of the initial moves during Yellen's Q&A can be trusted. I am right there with you. Um, you know, drawn back to what happened last year, you know, I'd mentioned a little earlier, that was one of the more profound reversals I've ever seen in my career, and it was. the. Flash points seem to be here in oil. This was February 11th, February 10th and 11th of last year. It's pretty astounding. Okay, so 2016 opens in a really nasty fashion. Oil prices are just getting crushed, crushed, crushed. February 11th was day two of Cherry Yellen's testimony last year in February. Uh, day one was right here. Now on day one, she was asked point blank, I believe it was the Senate this time, that asked her, what would you, what's your opinion on negative rates? Her response was, we looked at it at the Fed, we don't even know if it's legal. And then the selling across markets in oil and equities, it continued, and we, we stayed with some dollar strength. And then on day two, she was asked that same exact question, this time by the House, and she said, there's no policy options that we're going to take off of the table. A markedly different response, even though neither response really gave an answer, right? Both of them were kind of evasive. One was evasive with a negative tone, the other was evasive with a positive tone. But that positive tone, I mean, it really took over, and that substantiated a heck of a move in oil prices. The stock prices basically double over the next four months. Uh, coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, the S&P 500 recovered miraculously over that same period of time. What had turned into a very troubling dump to start the year, notice right there, December 30th, 2015. I mean, this was an aggressive move lower. But February 11th right here marked the low. 
and then another rip run run over the next four months until eventually the Fed was ready to hike again. And then we got to the election. They didn't want to hike in front of an election. They waited and then got us to here. Here's a really good outlook. This is from Pete. Uh, back to the basics, cable, dollar yen, euro dollar, banks and cabbage this week. Longer term yen cross should be a good set. Uh, euro yen has been amazing. Aussie, Aussie yen might be ready to take it up to the 88 target. I like it, my friend. You know, and the reason I wanted to point that out and emphasize it, though, is that when we do get into one of these periods where it seems like errant tweets are driving price action a little bit too far, and it might seem like the whole world's on crazy pills because everybody's focusing on, on uh, Twitter beefs or whatever, um, go back to the basics. You know, you, you guys, you see me do this with price action all the time. When the fundamental environment gets messy, I just draw back to what I know, which is price, uh, support and resistance, and, you know, very simple trend line and, and uh, technical analysis. But you know, I think that's the importance of experience, kind of like I was explaining to Chris a little earlier as far as getting familiar with price action. So the more you see it, the more you become familiar with it, the better you know how to react, the better you know how to, um, you know, kind of shift or shape the approach. And then when you have trades like I had today, you know whether or not there's something to fix or if it was just a setup that didn't work. Critical analysis is very important to the long-term health of a trader. Um, here's a really good question. If you see obvious exhaustion below 115, would you close the additional profit and wait to re-enter the trade? And this is speaking of Euro. Uh, I would not. Uh, if I set a plan, I'm, I'm generally pretty sticky to that plan unless an underlying material fact changes. That's the big difference. So um, let's just say that Draghi hit the wires in the next 10 minutes and he said, you know, I know everybody's been thinking that we're going to exit stimulus, but I'm actually going to do another round. That changes the game. At that point, I would look at, 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 at cutting out early, closing out what I got, and looking elsewhere uh, for my next setups. You know, but that would be a, a shift in the facts of the underlying scenario, not necessarily a shift with what's happening with price action. I fully expect it to taper off and weaken as we get towards 115. But that's why I had that target at 114.80 so that I get to take a piece off looking for that next topside break. If the topside break doesn't happen, at least I took a piece off for my trouble. Uh, from Ben Brook, how is that a bull flag when it's downward trending or trending downward? Well, because of this. The move that ran into the flag was far more bullish than the movement in the channel itself. So a bull flag is a bullish movement with a downward sloping channel that retraces a portion of the initial bullish move. The objective of a bull flag is to try to time a trend resumption setup, which I was trying to do, but did not. So I'm still looking for that support. I still think that we could get some support digging into that zone. Uh, from Jack Kong, what's your opinion on crude oil? There's really only one way I'd want exposure on this right now. That's the short side. Um, yeah, I've been pretty bearish on crude for a while now, and I think that there's a very fundamental issue that is wrong with, uh, with well, not wrong, but very fundamental issue that that will plague this this very key segment of the global economy for the coming months. And it's... So last week we had that report that came out, and I'm not going to list the investment bank out of professional courtesy, but one of these banks said that oil was being driven lower by fake news, which to me was almost intellectually assaulting. Um, you know, and I'm not the guy that's you know, out there saying oil should go lower or anything like that. I'm just looking at a bearish stance. I'm an individual trader. But I think it was intellectually dishonest because if you look at oil, it has w underwent a game-changing deal over the last 10 years with the oncoming of American shale. The U.S. used to be a massive importer of energy. Now it's the U.S. is able to export energy, now legally able to export energy. And, you know, oncoming of supplies to that degree, it, it shifts the backdrop for a market. So to say that that's fake news, it, it seems not only presumptuous, but it appears as though somebody is trying to use, you know, these memes uh, that are that are very popular today to try to further their own research. Uh, 
the fact of the matter is, is that market has changed, has shifted in the past 20 years as we've had ZERP. And ZERP is a big reason for it, right? Because this is the financial collapse right in here. Financial collapse oil prices get down about 34, 35 a barrel. And then you got a lot of folks in Texas that are just sweating bullets at that point, pun intended. But as oil prices recover, you got to remember, rates at this time were extremely, extremely low. So if you work at a bank and your bank has a lot of cash, they need to invest so that they can make a return to report to their shareholders. Where are you going to invest? American economy is morbid, uh, more bound at that point and trying to come back. Well, you have relatively stable oil prices. You have all of these shale extraction outfits in the United States that are figuring out ways to get oil out of the ground. And again, price is relatively stable. So if you're a bank, it's a, it's a good investment, even if you have to take on some credit risk. Because at the very least, you have a good idea. Those folks will be pumping something out of the ground that will be able to cover their debts. Well, as that goes on, more and more shale extraction takes place. As more and more shale extraction takes place, the average cost to extract shale decreases. Research and development costs get more and more recouped the longer that this goes. So the average break even for a price of oil or drilling a price of oil or extracting a price of oil out of shale it continues to go down. And what does that do? That incentivizes folks in Texas and Pennsylvania and Montana to continue drilling until eventually you have so much supply that prices just crater. Now, we know what produced that. We talked about it a little earlier. That was Chair Yellen's speech, February 11th, 2016, Humphrey Hawkins. She said she would not take negative rates off of the table. A little bit later, we had that OPEC, non-OPEC uh, production extension or production cut, and then the extension was listed right here. But to my eyes, this thing has been in a longer-term bearish pattern for almost the entirety of the move. This 17-year trend line, it still exists. And the week that we had that extension announced, prices resisted right off of that. So I think that this is very interesting from a longer-term perspective because I do think that we are seeing a shift within the dynamics of oil. I think that, that shift is going to continue to to continue to increase. And just as Goldman Sachs said a little bit earlier today, unless OPEC comes up with something new, then I think that oil prices are headed below 40 a barrel and probably even some more. So I really only want to look at short side ex exposure on oil at the moment. <clears throat> okay, I got seven minutes, ton of questions. I'm gonna to try to run through as many of these as I can. So I'm gonna do a little bit of rapid fire. Uh, for Brian Chastain, does it matter if it's a swing high or swing low or just that it's a level of support? It, it very much depends on context. Um, a swing high and swing low just on its face has the same potential value as an inflection point for me. It, it's the context what happens after or before that's going to tell me how powerful or how important that level might be. And then, of course, it's the follow-up reaction that's going to lead into the entry. Um, somebody asking to share Don Jr.'s tweet. Uh, I'd prefer not to. I don't want to get in the, uh, in the middle of a political kerfuffle. Um, on top of that, I believe it was a really, really very long tweet. I think he just tweeted out the exact emails. So uh, we'd be here for the rest of the webinar just reading those. Uh, from Alexander, um, James, opinion on Aussie Key. What's fueling Kiwi weakness? And is it really much stronger than uh, dovish RBA? Well, Kiwi put in the big reversal after last night. Um, I think last night's when this thing really started to kick off, or at least that's when it got my attention. I think the thing that would be most on my mind is the fact that this is a kind of a sea of change for Kiwi. Kiwi's been really strong up until this recent little dose of weakness, whereas Aussie has been in somewhat of that trepidatious pattern for a little while, as uh, I think a lot of folks have known that that trend line is there. Um, Aussie Key, we looked at this last week. I was looking at this for a uh, uh, for a bullish set for a couple of different reasons. Those reasons have shifted, but the tech still hold up, so I would still still be open to playing something bullish off this. We're a little bit far away from support for my taste. Yeah, I wouldn't want to buy it at this point. But you can see where it's really trying to stretch. Uh, this feels very overbought to me. I think what would be a, a very attractive setup would be is if we could break through these quick swings, because you can see where there was a lot of buyers that were responding in here. If we could break through those quick swings to clear out the sentiment, 
just real fast. And then if I could find something around 105 to 104 and three quarters, I think that'd be a pretty decent, pretty decent topside set on Aussie Key. Uh, from Pete, I don't think folks realize how high Euro Yen could go rather quickly. Yes, exactly. I mean, these cross pairs, you know, when both of these themes get to move in one direction, it is greased lightning. Because if you're seeing Euro strength and Yen weakness concurrently, then this thing will go parabolic regardless of what resistance levels it's bucking up against or what support levels it had to run through. It doesn't care. Uh, you know, it goes into honey badger mode and it just keeps running. Now, with all that said, that doesn't mean if you see a cross pair that's on the run that you need to chase it because I think that's the most perilous way of trying to gain exposure into those situations. I think, if anything, you know, you kind of take what Pete and I look at in these webinars and say, okay, well, we have a scenario where that could exist. Now I have price at support and I can look at a 150 pip stop to try to play for a 300 pip pop. You know, I think something like that is the way to look at these scenarios rather than, uh-oh, you're really going to move, I'm going to try to get along. That uh, has a tendency to bring adverse results, unfortunately. Uh, from George. George, hope, you, hope you're well. Uh, hi, James. Uh, only when you have free time. Such a gentleman. Uh, can you look at Kiwi CAD with BOC rate statement tomorrow? Thanks. Yeah. Um, CAD's stretched. CAD's real, real stretched right now. <laughs> oh, man. It's a good setup, George. <laughs> You know, I only laugh because it's it, it kind of like watching somebody dance ballet on a tripwire from, um, you know, suspended from a high rise. You know, we had a, a pretty voluminous drop in here, and then it came back to, to check support in this prior point of resistance that's right at a FIB level, uh, 93.48. It's pretty tight, but I think that could be workable on something really short term. Um, Yeah, I think it could be workable on something really short term. I say it's really tight. I mean, we're only about 10 pips off here, so I probably want to give it a little bit more wiggle room. But it could be a, a trend side type of setup. Um, you know, again, it's really stretched, really, really stretched. But if I really wanted short exposure, then I could, I could make the negotiation there. Uh, from Dar Uh what are your thoughts on? Wait, is that uh, German for the ant? My German's a little rusty, but uh, what are your thoughts on pound yen? So I love the pair. Um, I even like the pullback, but I, I need to see support show before I'm going to be able to do anything here because that pullback has been really aggressive so far. Um, and that bar is 58 minutes old, and it's showing me a doji. If I get another hourly bar that does not break through that low, I could could look at the topside resumption approach under the presumption that we are seeing some element of support develop here. I think more than anything, the point of attraction there is the continuation of yen weakness. <laughs> Pete, my man. Um, all right, I see a bunch of questions here from uh, Mr. Mirage Patel. With a lot of questions here, but I don't quite understand them. So uh, we're going to go ahead and skip. Yeah, Chris H., uh, keep it simple when it comes to price action. I like your style. Okay, so here's a comment here from Mirage. July 2006 at Merrill Lynch, the interns have to take a photo on Be Bullish. It takes them, takes from then to get public workforce system job placement. Sorry, buddy, I don't really understand what you're asking there. Can't quite help. Uh, for Ben Brook, where can you find the links or the webinars that have already been recorded? Uh, good question. So we have a couple of different areas that we place those recordings. Uh, the first one is right here. You'll notice Daily Effects TV. We'll load all of those into that plugin. But they're also available on YouTube. The easiest way to find a specific analyst's webinars 
you could click on my name in any article that you see, and that's going to go over my prior publishing, uh, anything that I've published in the past. Uh, prior webinar was right in here, I believe it was uh, July 6th, that one. So yeah, you go in the article and you can watch it in its entirety. But uh, every webinar we do, pretty much every pretty much every webinar we do is uh, is uploaded just like that, within Daily Effects, within an article available to you from for whenever you want it. Pete's saying, uh, seriously talking 800 pips more by end of year, Euro Yen. You know, and just like Pete's saying, when those moves really get starting, I mean, they, they don't slow down. They don't stop. They do not stop. Uh, from Chris H., James, there's not a lot of people who cover price action quite the way you do. Yeah, I know. I think a lot of folks just like to use it for the search engine optimization value. And, uh, you know, they, they don't really use it at all. Um but, you know, I, I think that in trading, it's really important to kind of have your own swing and your own way to do things because at the end of the day, it's it's your profit line you got to protect. It's it's your stops you got to cover, you know, and uh, if you're not comfortable with it, if you're having to run from somebody else's swing or from somebody else's direction, you're never really going to know what you're doing. You're just going to kind of be waiting for that next, uh, that next hat tip or, you know, the next signal or whatever. But, you know, the way that I look at markets is they're more governed by chaos theory than anything because at any given moment in time, any number of scenarios can happen and that can massively change what's going on in any market that we're following. Um, that's why stops are so utterly, utterly, utterly important. So I'm much less concerned with trying to increase my batting average and I'm much more concerned with trying to increase my profit line. The only way to really do that is to either take tighter losses, smaller losses, or get bigger wins, one or the other. The bigger wins part's a little bit out of my hands because that's all based on market forces and how long or how far a run may, may last or how far a move may, may, may drive. But the loss mitigation aspect is squarely on my shoulders. That's 100% mine. So my job is basically to try to play defense play defense so that my offense can take care of itself. And then when I do get those home run markets, like those, that dollar yen run in, uh, at the end of Q2 or the euro dollar run like I'm in right now or, you know, any of these good sets, then my job becomes really very easy. All I got to do is manage my stops and scale out of positions as it works in my favor. But I think the reason that you see that disconnect is because – Mine's a lot more theoretically or uh, more practically practical based than theoretical. Um, you know, I know for a fact the support and resistance is rarely perfect. You know, rarely do we get a setup like this where each of these little iterations of support come in at higher lows. Normally we'll get some tests, we'll get a little probing below that. So that's why you always see me using zones as opposed to hard set and fast lines. Hard set and fast lines don't work. It's too theoretical, too academic. In reality, if you the the in between the spread is chaos. It's it's sloppy. There's little rhyme or reason. But if you expect price action to stop just perfectly at a point of support or a point of resistance, it's a little too idealistic. I don't think that's going to happen very often. So I'm looking for zones, and here's a good example, right? We're getting a little bit of a retracement here in pound yen right now. Now, there's a couple of different ways that I can handle this. I was looking for this to come in a little bit deeper, but if this thing does hold, well, then I could look at an even tighter stop. Right in there, basically just playing off this little four candle sequence off the hourly chart. Right? I need a little bit more confirmation, but the fact that these buyers came in a little bit higher than here, the fact the buyers are now taking control of this little short term swing. There you go. I could use all these time frames, right? Try to line it up. It's like looking through a keyhole. All right, my friends, that is what I have for today. Um, just want to say thank you so much to everybody for your time. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. I am certainly available over Twitter. Happy to help.
one available right here. Oh. Let me get that cleaned up. There we go, available right there. Uh, just go ahead and hit me up with a question, and I'm more than happy to help however I might be able to. But, folks, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day, and as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.